Well, first of all, I have to apologize for my slides because I wasn't well organized enough to actually have them ready when they were requested, and I'm, I'm really sorry. I looked at them this morning and I thought they are not as good as they should be, but um, they are what they are, so apologies. Uh, what, I, um, what I'm going to talk about is really a work that um, I have been doing with colleagues in Colombia over the past two and a half years. And uh, this is really, this is my personal, I'm just finishing an article and it's my personal reflection so that we've just finished a book in Colombia in Spanish on this. And now this is just my, my personal take on it, trying to make sense of some of the issues that came out of uh, this work. So, for, well, I'm not really going to talk about, like everybody else, about business and human rights. So there is a link to business and human rights, of course. But what I'm really concerned about is more transitional justice and in the context of transitional justice, to what extent, uh, well, corporate actors, but in particular individuals, because I'm going to focus on criminal liability, cr criminal responsibility of um, economic actors for their role in uh, armed conflict, to what extent that can be addressed by transitional justice. So maybe briefly, because I'm not sure that everybody is familiar with transitional justice, very, very briefly, tra transitional justice is really, it's, it's a, well, <laughs> One can talk about the definition forever, I don't have the time. But what it is mainly about is a society trying to come to terms with a period of mass uh, human rights violations, usually either uh, in transitions from uh, conflict to peace, as in Colombia, or from repression to uh, democracy, like, for example, in Argentina, uh, Chile, and other countries in Latin America. So in, in these situations, what we, what we face, first of all, is, of course, lots of problems in terms of administering justice. What, because uh, this morning, um, the Colombian colleague, I think, has just left, but this morning we heard about Colombia and we heard about the massive scale of the human rights violations. We are talking about millions of victims and we are talking about thousands of perpetrators. And so, of course, if you think about that scale, it's already clear that, uh, that you cannot bring everybody to court. You cannot really have criminal trials against uh, everybody, uh, you can't really have reparations, full reparations as you would have under normal circumstances for the harm you cause someone. So you have to already, there are lots of trade-offs involved in trying to, in thinking about how do you deal with this. Colombia faces the additional problem that this was a negotiated piece. So as we again heard this morning, those of you who were in this room and listened to the Colombia um, presentation, what we heard there is that, and, and what of course most of you will know, is that in Colombia there was, uh, well basically in Havana, there were several years of negotiations between the Colombian government and the largest guerrilla group, uh, FARC, uh, and so they negotiated this peace agreement. Um, so, which causes, of course, uh, its own problems because of the compromises that, uh, that you have to reach in this, uh, in, in this process. So now the, the negotiating parties were the government and the uh, leaders of the, uh, of the FARC, but what they came up with, well, uh, well maybe let's, let's uh, talk about, sorry, uh, let's, let's talk about the more general issues first of all and then I'll come to Colombia. So um, in general, and this is a problem in the context of Colombia, as we've heard about uh, over these two years, international law and transitional justice as maybe part of international law, although that's debatable as well, and to what extent it is even law, a special area of law, but it's based on international criminal law and international human rights law and international uh, humanitarian law, so it has, uh, it has basis in international law. Of course, as we know, international law is very much state-centered, and this is why normally transitional justice processes focus on the role of state actors and then uh, in the context of conflict on uh, the role of uh, the armed groups, but it doesn't usually focus on anybody else. And so we don't really have in international, we, first of all, we don't really have international precedents really telling us how do we actually include these other groups if we think they played an important role in the conflict. If they did, then there might be a good reason to actually want to include them and hold them to account as well. But we really have very, and, and this is uh, what this came to light very much in the context of the Colombia work. There is very little international experience and very little international precedent. In fact, I was invited, and I felt like a total cheat. I was invited several times to meetings as an, a so-called international expert, and I was always um, 
asked to talk about international experience, and I always had to say, well, there is very little. I'm so sorry, but um, there is very, very little you can actually draw on. And including the academic debate is very much at its beginnings. How can you actually include, should you include, and if so, how, these actors in uh, these already very um, precarious um, transitional justice processes? But the reason, one of the reasons why in Colombia this came up was because Colombia really tried to um, negotiate a peace agreement, whatever one might think about it, but what they were de definitely trying very hard was to negotiate a peace agreement that would stand up to international scrutiny. So they, and part of that was the awareness, and particularly in the context of the inter-American system, um, of the state obligation to investigate, prosecute, and punish, and that that includes all actors. So it does not just include state actors, it doesn't just include um, the crimes committed by the armed groups, but if, other, if there are other actors who had a role to play and had an important role to play, um, the uh, state obligation um, extends to them as well. And so this is why, from the very beginning, already during the negotiations in Havana, the question arose um, how to do it. Now, um, very, very briefly, uh, because Colombia is interesting because they have, they, they already, they have an ongoing uh, pr transitional justice process, the justice and peace process. I don't really have time to say much about it. But this started in 2005, and this is a peace process um, that focused on the demobilization of uh, the paramilitary groups. And it, it offered paramilitaries who demobilize alternative sanctions of uh, five to eight uh, years of imprisonment um, for truth and reparations, very um, simplified version of this. But what happened in, so it was only limited to them. It excluded everybody else. Now, the, one of the problems with that was that in the conic, so, so they got these uh, alternative sanctions, but uh, against uh, these very, very broad confessions. So during these very, very long confessions, they came up with all sorts of information about all sorts of other actors. So they might, have, they might say, you know, we did this, that, and the other, but the, all of these different economic actors, partly companies, partly small business, partly, partly landowners, all sorts of different groups, they actually paid us, they partly they asked us to do this, they, um, they, they gave us logistics, they, um, they, were, they were the ben beneficiaries of uh, the land grabbing and the land displacement, etc. So a lot of information came out, but because they were not included in the transitional justice process, the problem was that the trans transitional justice, the, uh, the specific tribunals set up with these, uh, with these um, alternative sanctions, they didn't have jurisdiction over them. So they then had to um, refer these cases to the ordinary jurisdiction, which caused... Uh, well, a fragmentation, I, uh, I, um, yeah, I'm a bit reluctant to use the word after this morning, but it caused a fragmentation of the process and, uh, and lots of uh, problems with it. And partly because, of course, for the economic actors, because they were excluded, there were no incentives whatsoever to confess. To the contrary, um, because they, to them, ordinary uh, criminal sanctions uh, would apply. So that was the situation when they thought in Havana, uh, they thought about how to deal with this. And um, <clears throat> and basically, one of the reasons so one of the reasons why they, they in, in Havana did think about including them is because the information was there in the justice and peace process. A lot of information had come out about the important role of these actors. So, question was how to deal with them rather than whether to deal with them. And very very briefly, because I am conscious of time, um, this is just these are just a few of the um, aims and of, of, of the objectives of the uh, special jurisdiction for peace, which is the criminal um, the criminal compo the criminal justice component of the transitional justice, uh, the current transitional justice uh, system, the one uh, that followed the peace agreement with the FARC. So they want to satisfy the victim's right to truth, offer truth to the Colombian society, protect the rights of victims, contribute to achieving a stable and lasting peace. And already we can see there are quite a few tensions between these various, um, between these various um, objectives, even if you leave outside the um, more complexities like bringing in other uh, actors. Now, when the special jurisdiction for peace was, um, when, when it was first established, and, uh, and, and when the peace agreement thought about how it, it envisaged it, it was given jurisdiction over everybody. Everybody who had any role in crimes uh, that, were con that were, had a relationship with the conflict, with the armed conflict, um, was under the jurisdiction of the um, special jurisdiction for peace, including then, of course, economic actors. So for once that came out in December 2015, this was decided. So then uh, we spent about two years trying to figure out how this could possibly be implemented because, as I said, there is very, very little uh, 
international experience on what what does that actually mean so they have jurisdiction but if you th if you see this uh, this inclusion of these actors in the context of the Colombian uh, peace process which gave largest possible amnesties to um, to the guerrilla fighters and to then at the same time included everybody else question was what does that mean so what it seemed to have meant and i'm saying all of this in in the conditional because um, quite a few things have changed since then um, what it what it was me what it was meant to to mean at the time was that they should get uh, far furthest reaching um, waves of criminal prosecution against truth and reparations and only really in, in the situation of their um, most, w w where they were the most responsible for the most serious crimes, then uh, they would actually face uh, criminal sanctions, but they would get exactly the same uh, possibilities of alternative sanctions as the um, primary perpetrators. Now, then the, uh, this caused enormous fractions, um, and of course economic actors are a very powerful uh, sector of society. They did not like the idea at all that they were included, which is interesting because actually I always thought, um, you look at me, do I, how, how, how am I doing for time? You're okay, you've got another five. Minutes. Oh, fantastic, I was just <laughs> misinterpreted you. Okay, per perfect, great. So, uh, so basically, I, I thought this is actually good for them. If they go, most of them are going to get, uh, they, they are actually going to get out of this um, legal certainty in the form of uh, a waiver of prosecution. The large majority of them would, was, would get it. And uh, maybe very, very few might potentially face criminal sanctions. But if they do, what they would get is um, these alternative sanctions which are much better of what some of those got who actually were. There were very, very few cases in the ordinary jurisdiction in, in parallel to the justice and peace process. But there is, for example, a case where, um, where several company direct directors um, were convicted and they got, um, they, they got um, punishments of 14 to 16 years, which is, of course, quite a lot uh, more than what they would get here. Mm -hmm. But there was such a they are part, such a powerful group and they, they had such a powerful lobby that they managed to almost derail the transitional justice uh, process in Colombia. And in the end, in, in November 2017, the Constitutional Court intervened, and the Constitutional Court had to actually um, they, it had to decide whether or not the um, implementing uh, legislation was constitutional. And what they decided was it was unconstitutional what, what had been uh, decided in Havana and was then part of this uh, legislation implementing uh, the peace agreement. And that now the special jurisdiction for peace only has jurisdiction over uh, these third party actors, including economic actors, if they voluntarily go. So now we have a system whereby they can decide if they want to go, they can go, they can confess, they can... Uh, they can uh, pay reparation, and then they, they and, and then depending on the level of the responsibility, they either get um, they, they either get um, a criminal sanction, a lower criminal sanction, or they get um, in most cases uh, the waiver of um, of prosecution. If not, they can take their chances in the ordinary jurisdiction, and there is wide widespread impunity, and so um, it, it might be a good bet unless there is a lot of information about uh, them in particular, then it might be a good way. But also, of course, we now again have parallel jurisdiction and we have um, some problems. So coming to some first lessons, of course, this is all happening. The, hep, the special jurisdiction for peace only started working on the 15th of March, so it's a bit early to really have a lot of uh, proper lessons from Colombia. So this is really just more about the process and the um, discussions and the problems. So first of all, what we have is economic actors did play an important role in the conflict. What we don't really know and what, uh, what um, I think the, uh, the, the jurisdiction should try and figure out is to what extent were they actually responsible for, for the crimes and to what extent were they actually coerced because of course a lot of uh, in many cases in Colombia, they can actually rightly say um, they, there was extortion, there was coercion, etc. So uh, we really need to be able to distinguish very clearly. But <clears throat> what, what we can learn from Colombia then is if there is a special transitional justice process like what they are doing now, the main possibilities of dealing with these economic actors are, as far as I can see, and would be interesting to see what you think, uh, three. Either we leave them outside completely, as was, uh, was done in Justice and Peace, um, or we uh, include them as they tried uh, and treat them exactly the same as the state actors and the uh, combatants, or we have this hybrid system uh, that we have now and they, they have the choice 
to, to go either to this uh, to, to, to take part in transitional justice or stay outside of this. These are probably the main uh, ways of dealing with this. So now just some, and I might not have time to, to go through all of this, or will not have time. Um, if you leave them outside of the transitional justice method process, of course it doesn't mean that therefore they cannot be held accountable, which is why I personally always thought it wasn't beneficial for them, because if they go, then um, they get legal certainty, but if they stay outside, uh, then of course these, we, what we're dealing with here, maybe just to give the context, it was, I, I'm just too focused on, on the legal side, but if you think about, for example, financing, so it, we're talking very much about complicity in these in these. Uh, in, in this context. So we're talking about, for example, the, this is maybe the most well-known case, Chiquita, and, uh, the, um, and, and the allegations are that they spend millions and millions of uh, Colombian pesos uh, per month paying uh, the, both sides, in fact, um, and they, of course, use this money to carry out a very serious uh, c criminal offences. So then the question is, how do we actually deal with this? What, what, uh, but what we, what we do know is these are crimes against humanities and, they will, and their involvement in that will not prescribe. There is no, it's not statute barred. So therefore, if they don't go, uh, 30, 40, 50 years later, um, people can still uh, bring them to court. And this is what ha what's happening in Argentina at the moment. 40 years after the, um, after the military di dictatorship, there are criminal trials against uh, various uh, com company directors. So that is part of the problem. So therefore, I always thought it was actually positive for them. Now, including them, then, uh, well, let's maybe not even focus on the, on, the, on the reasons why they are easier to just imagine. But some of the problems is, of course, first of all, the fierce resistance of these actors who really have a lot of power in this very fragile situation. So then the question is, is it really the best way of, uh, of dealing with this, that you include them from the outset when they actually really can spoil the whole process, which they almost, sorry... Um, can I just have half a minute? Okay. Um, <clears throat> but then also a big problem is the lack of, of clear legal criteria because we have a lot of experience um, in thinking about how do we define the responsibility of the direct perpetrators, those who actually carried out the torture, the killings, the displacement, etc. But how do we actually define the level of responsibility of those who gave money? Is it really at the same level? Is it something different? So there are all sorts of uh, open questions here, and this is why, um, at, well, why I am still, after all, after all this time working there, I'm still a bit torn um, about, so at the moment, my, my personal uh, lesson is more um, that I appreciate the complexities and the problems, because I really think there is a lot to be said about trying to include them, but at the same time there is also a lot to be said about thinking about sequencing and actually leaving them outside and then thinking about further down the line how to deal with these actors. But what I do think is, and with this I finish, that, that it is not an option sim simply not to do anything and ignore their role. The question has to be how do we address it and um, Colombia can I think tell us a lot but um, obviously we'll have to wait and see how it develops. Thank you.